The news headline screams, Billionaire blasts off to space for joyride while millions on Earth can't afford basic necessities. It's a story that's become all too common, a single individual with a wealthier net worth than some small countries, enough to solve problems like homelessness, not just once, but over and over again. This is the reality of the billionaire class, and it forces us to ask a fundamental question. Is it morally acceptable? Welcome to the staggering reality of the billionaire class. But today, we're not marveling at their lifestyles. We're putting them on trial, a moral trial. Can a just society allow the existence of such extreme wealth while so many struggle? American philosopher John Rawls thought not. His landmark work, A Theory of Justice, has shaped how we think of fairness and equality for decades. Rawls asks us to design a society from behind a veil of ignorance, not knowing whether we'd be born rich, poor, or somewhere in between. So how would those hypothetical rules we all agree to hold up in a world with billionaires? Would we allow such a stark imbalance of power and opportunity? Or would we say there's a moral limit on how much any one person can own while others go without basic necessities? Imagine a group of people gathered to design a society from scratch. But there's a catch. The veil of ignorance hangs over them. They know nothing of their future status. They might be born into wealth and privilege or into a life of hardship. No one knows if they'll be healthy or have disabilities. They could possess brilliant minds or face learning challenges. This is the core of John Rawls's famous thought experiment. He believed that behind this veil, with our self-interest masked, we'd agree on two fundamental principles of justice. The liberty principle. Every person has an equal right to basic freedoms, like the freedom of speech, association, and the right to participate in the political process. The difference principle. Some inequality in wealth and social position is allowed but only if it works to the benefit of the least advantaged in society. Think a doctor earning slightly more than a janitor, but only if those higher earnings help fund services the janitor needs. Now apply this to the billionaire question. Can such a concentration of wealth truly work to the benefit of everyone in a way that's morally justified? Picture yourself behind the veil. Would you gamble on being the billionaire and accept the risk of being born into crushing poverty? Or would you demand safeguards, limits on just how far one person is allowed to rise while others fall behind? Rawls argues for a kind of self-interested rationality when we don't know where we'll land on society's ladder. We'd want to ensure the worst-case scenario isn't truly dire. And this is precisely where the existence of billionaires crashes into Rawls's ideals. Is a society with a billionaire class and millions barely surviving a society any of us would design if we had that clean slate at the start? Could we honestly say a billionaire, no matter how much they create, benefits the poorest more than if their vast wealth were partially distributed or taxed to fund things like healthcare, education, and a basic social safety net that could lift millions out of destitution? The moral problem with billionaires isn't just about how their massive wealth could be used to directly help the most destitute. Rawls compels us to think about how such an imbalance alters the fabric of society itself, eroding the very notion of fairness. Consider the idea of a level playing field. Behind the veil of ignorance, we'd want a system where everyone, regardless of birth, has a reasonable shot at success. But extreme wealth accumulation shatters this. Billionaires' heirs inherit not just financial wealth, but access to exclusive networks, elite education, and an inside track to power. It's a head start the child of a single parent working two jobs could never dream of, no matter their talent or drive. This inequality of opportunity undermines the meritocratic ideals most of us hold dear. Furthermore, Rawls's ideas are at war with the notion of trickle-down economics. For decades, proponents have argued that allowing the wealthy to become wealthier benefits everyone. The billionaire's new yacht supposedly creates jobs for shipbuilders, who then have more money to spend on local businesses, and so on. However, recent economic studies have debunked this myth. Wealth does not magically trickle down. It tends to concentrate at the top, stagnating in stock portfolios and luxury assets, while the wages of the average worker stagnate. In the Rawlsian framework, this inequality is unjustifiable if it doesn't truly make life better for the least advantaged. Finally, concentrated wealth translates into concentrated power. 
Billionaires can lobby politicians, influence legislation, even shape the media landscape in ways out of reach of the everyday citizen. Rawls believed in democracy, in the power of the collective working to create a fairer system for all. But when billionaires can, through campaign donations or media ownership, outshout the rest of us, does the ideal of a society governed of the people, by the people, for the people, crumble? Now you might be thinking, these are nice ideas, but the world doesn't work this way. Defenders of the billionaire class often make compelling arguments. Firstly, there's the idea that we need the super rich because they are the ultimate innovators. Their risk-taking drives progress, creates groundbreaking companies, and theoretically generates jobs that benefit society as a whole. Rawls, though, would be skeptical. Does the very existence of billionaires actually fuel more beneficial innovation than a system with a slightly smaller wealth gap, but more widely distributed capital? Imagine a scenario where venture capital funds, fueled by a tax system that doesn't allow for extreme wealth accumulation, could invest in a broader range of ideas and entrepreneurs. Perhaps this would lead to even more groundbreaking discoveries, not just from those who inherit wealth and privilege, but from talented individuals who currently lack the resources to get their ideas off the ground. Then there's the idea of billionaire philanthropists. Think Bill Gates committing a large part of his fortune to tackling global health crises. On the surface, this seems benevolent. However, it raises the question of whether we should rely on the whims of the ultra-wealthy for basic societal problems to be addressed. Why is private philanthropy necessary to get mosquito nets to children at risk of malaria, while simultaneously that same billionaire might benefit from tax loopholes the average citizen can't exploit? This raises doubts about the fairness of the system as a whole. Rawls would argue that a just society wouldn't leave basic human needs to the charity of a select few, but ensure a tax system that distributes resources more equitably to address these issues, regardless of the whims of the wealthy. Finally, there's the fundamental argument against limiting any individual's ambition. The American dream is often built on the idea of the self-made billionaire, the proof that anyone can rise to the top. Capping individual wealth, so the argument goes, stifles that very drive, harming society in the long run. Rawls would respond to this with his difference principle. Yes, some inequality can be justified as a motivator, but at the extremes we see now, is it truly ambition and innovation being rewarded, or is the system warped to favor those already at the top, regardless of their actual contribution? Does anyone work harder or innovate better than the collective efforts of millions facing real hardship, whose potential and contributions to society are stifled by poverty? Imagine a system where a strong social safety net allows everyone a basic standard of living, health care, and education. Wouldn't this unleash a wave of innovation and productivity from a broader segment of the population, not just the privileged few? So, does Rawls offer a perfect solution to the question of billionaires? That's debatable, but let's explore how his ideas might be adapted, or if he points us towards entirely new frameworks for addressing extreme inequality. John Rawls provides us with a moral compass, not a perfect instruction manual for a complex global economy. Could a modified version of his theory of justice still work in the face of 21st century complexities and the vast power of the billionaire class? Perhaps we don't abolish billionaires entirely, but combine a Rawlsian approach with significantly higher inheritance taxes, disincentivizing the passing down of extreme wealth over generations. Maybe we pair that with a guaranteed minimum income for all, ensuring everyone's basic needs are met as a starting point not an afterthought reliant on charity. It's about finding systems that work to raise the floor of society without completely eliminating the potential for exceptional success to be rewarded. Others argue that Rawls's framework designed for a single nation state is insufficient when dealing with global inequalities. Billionaires can exploit loopholes, shifting wealth across borders to avoid taxes that would benefit those in the country where the wealth was generated. This calls for new models of global cooperation, international tax reform, and a way to apply Rawlsian principles of fairness on a truly worldwide scale. Despite its limitations, Rawls's work remains powerful because it forces us away from simply marveling at or demonizing the individual billionaire. 
Instead, he focuses our attention on the system as a whole. Even if we don't all agree on the solutions, he ignites a much-needed conversation about the kind of world we want to live in. A world where extreme wealth is a quirk of the system, a relic of a less enlightened era, might seem idealistic. But behind Rawls's veil of ignorance, it's possible some version of that world is the very one we'd choose. John Rawls might not have solved the riddle of extreme wealth in a globalized, interconnected world. His theories might feel like abstract thought experiments compared to the very real power wielded by today's billionaires. But his work remains a moral benchmark. If nothing else, he demands we think seriously about what it means to create a just society. Is it a society where, by sheer accident of birth, some individuals have nearly infinite opportunity while others struggle to feed their families? Or is it a society built on a different understanding of how much any one person can truly claim while others lack basic necessities? The billionaire class is a stark reminder that we are far from achieving Rawls's ideal. He compels us to ask if our current economic and political systems are as fair as we like to tell ourselves, or if they are riddled with invisible biases that favor those already in privileged positions. Perhaps the greatest legacy of Rawls is to make us uncomfortable, to remind us that even our most basic assumptions about fairness, opportunity, and the social contract are worth re-examining.